All right. Well, welcome everyone to um, the Getting Your Garden Started workshop series. This is the first of five weeks um, in this time together. Our goal is to help you design a garden plan um, for your space. Um, so we're going to be providing a lot of ideas, suggestions, um, but our goal is to really help you to take those things and transition them to meet your gardening goals. Um, so what we're going to be doing, um, we're going to be spending time today is talking about site selection. Um, we're going to learn how to start seeds at home. We're going to learn what to plant when. We're all going to become soil scientists, learn about soil amendments. So that's like fertilizer, compost, manure. Um, so what it is, what to do about it. Do you need it or not? Uh, we're going to talk about all those things. Um, we're also going to talk about a lot about water because plants, all plants need water. Um, Lilius and I are here to support you all through this five weeks. Um, we're also available afterwards by email or phone to keep checking in and answering questions. So we hope this is kind of the beginning of our conversation and support of you gardening. Um, so we're very, very glad that you're here and joining us today. Do you want to chat, Lilius? Yeah, am I muted? No. Okay, so you can hear me. Um, okay, great. So just to get, just to kind of ground everybody and um, take a minute to um, have a little reflection, we want to ask you all to think about your goals as you, um, you know, saw this, class being posted and clicked on it and said, yeah, that sounds like the right thing for me. Um, we'd love for you to just take a minute to jot down or think through um, what, what it was that you wanted to get out of this class, what you're looking to learn and hoping to find out more about, um, you know, what your goals are in your um, garden for this year. Um, so just if you can take, you know, a minute um, or two to just jot down kind of what your goals are. Um, I think it's always a good place to start as you are going to be, as we're gonna help you work through creating a plan for your garden, your space. Okay, so some of you have um, finished thinking through those. If there's anybody who would like to share um, anything um, that you have thought about, any um, goals or um, ideas you have for what you want to do this year or even what you're interested in learning about, um, please either unmute yourself and um, share with us or you can type the, um, your comment in the chat box. Who's going to be brave and go first? Hi. Can you hear Hi. me? Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Helen from Dublin, Ireland. Hi, Helen. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm good. And I'm delighted to be able to participate in this um, series because I've just recently retired and I have enjoyed gardening all my life. And now that I have um, a lot more time available to me, I want to learn as much as possible, improve my gardening skills, work on doing out a 12 month uh, plan maintenance for the garden and 
to begin I've never really been my father would have been good at vegetables and that I've, I've known nothing at all about vegetables but I'd like to start this year that's so exciting congratulations on retiring thank you <laughs> It looks like Erin shared that um, they're interested in learning, maximizing the capacity to catch and hold water for gardening and wildlife habitat. Fantastic. We're definitely going to touch on some of that too. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I just got a message that maybe my voice was going in and out. So I just wanted to make sure. And if you can't, just let me know. Susanna wants to hone their skills, increasing confidence, expanding, organizing for four season gardening, increasing knowledge for water conservation and soil amendments, internalize knowledge and become more self-sufficient. All right, those are exciting goals. We are definitely going to touch on a lot of that. And I think one of the, one of my goals when I, um, when I share this knowledge with folks is that I really hope that it helps you all become just like more confident in yourself um, and in your ability to do this. Because for sure, gardening is an art and a science, right? And so there is, um, Bethany and I are going to share what we know and um, and give you some tools, hopefully, that help you make the right decisions in the right moments to, to do what you want to do at your, in your space. Um, let's see. September just bought a house with beautiful front garden boxes that weren't well maintained but have a lot of potential. And I'd love to create edible herb and vegetable garden there. That's also beautiful. Oh, fantastic. So you already have an idea of kind of what, where your space is and you're ready to get, get working on it. Love that. Um, Melissa is interested in growing more of their own food and reducing the amount of area that needs to be mowed and being a better steward of the environment. Definitely can help you reduce the amount of area <laughs> that needs to be mown, just adding a little garden space. Um, Cassie bought their first home at the end of the summer in a new area of town, looking forward to planning and learning about soil needs and best practices for getting started with intentional garden planning. Fantastic. I like that word intentional. Um, it's also, you know, I think a lot of times um, folks get a little intimidated about gardening because they might about gardening because they might not know how to make a plan. And I know a lot of people who are successful by just kind of going and throwing some seeds out and seeing what happens. You learn, you know, through experience. Um, and it's also helpful to kind of have that intention and and figure out what you want to do. Um, so there are a lot of different approaches. Um, and Karen's interested in learning more about soil. Um, to cultivate or not um, no dig gardens and that type of um, that type of work and so yeah we can definitely talk more about that. Does anybody else want to share um, with the group? I know I've been kind of reading everybody's chats out, but I'll let I'll stop a minute if anybody wanted to share out loud. Well, yes, I'll share something out loud if you can hear me. Yes, you can. Hey everyone, this is uh, Catherine. Helen, I have to give you a little shout out because I'm actually from Britain. So we are uh, <laughs> kind of uh, fellow immigrants here. But um, this year spending all this time at home and you know sitting around, I've gone from uh, killing every plant that I was ever involved with to actually managing to make some things thrive. And it's so incredibly satisfying to get something to grow and then be able to feed it to my children. So that is really what has kind of sparked this interest for me. Um, and I would love to get more tools and, and you know ideas and just confidence really to try and grow more things and specifically to grow more edible things and to get my children involved in that process and kind of share the joy of gardening with them, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing, Catherine. Would anybody else like to share um, maybe one more person then we can 
jump into planning? Let's see. I'll read this last comment that just went up on the chat from Katie. I want to grow vegetables. I tried last year without doing research, winged it, and she was they were successful in getting a few tomatoes and lettuces, um, but planted some other things that didn't grow or didn't get big enough. Um, they have a new spot this year with more sun, and so I'm hopeful. Well, that is, that's a good segue into um, what we're gonna talk about today, which is all about how to um, kind of scout your space and pick the right place for your garden. Yeah, so that's exciting. You guys are all here for um, the right reasons. And it's so it's so lovely to hear all of the reasons that folks are gardening and why they're here today. So thanks for everyone for sharing. Um, so as we're kind of beginning on this journey for the spring, summer, for the rest of the year, um, you all have probably already thought about a lot of these things, right? in terms of why you wanna grow. Maybe you've already thought about what you want to grow, things that you or your family want to eat or flowers or things that you would like to look at in your landscape. Um, if you are still thinking about where you want to put your garden, or if you have some idea of where your garden wants to go, where you would like your garden to go, um, that's really what we're gonna to explore today is um, some ideas about how to locate the garden that is the best place for you and for the things that you hope to grow. Um, so particularly if you are in an urban environment, um, you really want to start by checking in with your neighborhood association, your HOA, um, the city, if there are any rules around farms or gardens, um, particularly in Louisville, Kentucky, there are some HOAs that have restrictions on where vegetable gardens can be. Um, so I'm thinking of some neighborhoods where vegetable gardens cannot be on the front or street visible on your property. Um, so doesn't mean you can't have a vegetable garden. Um, it doesn't mean you actually can't even grow vegetables out front, but you've got to maybe start thinking creatively. So check in with what those rules are. Um, there may also be requirements about how lawn versus cultivated space and stuff. So if you're concerned, check in um, before you start digging. Um, the next thing you want to really think about for yourself is how much time do you have to garden personally? And when is that time? So do you only have time between 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. at night to garden? Is it really early in the morning? Um, when do you have time and then how much? If you have an hour a day, awesome. Do you have seven or eight hours a day? Also awesome. You can garden, you can set up your garden to accommodate the time that you have. Um, and so we'll be sharing more tips about that as you go along. Um, location, which we're gonna talk a whole lot about, kind of covers a lot of these next questions. So is the garden easy to get to? Um, the, the more you can see your garden, that it's kind of in your daily places of travel already, the more likely you are to be successful because you're gonna notice when things need water or if the things are ready to harvest, or if there are a lot of weeds. Just having it visible is a great way to um, hold yourself accountable. Also thinking about water. Several people talked about water um, and water conservation, which we're super excited about. Water is key for growing plants. So you want to plan to have water that is accessible to your garden. Um, I personally hate dragging garden hoses around. I don't want to drag more than like one garden hose length of hose around in my garden if that's how you're going to water. Um, so try to think about can you do you have the option to create water close to your garden or can you locate your garden close to water? Um, and we'll talk more about other like water storage options too. Um, so if you don't have a spigot on the outside of your house, maybe you're using rain barrels or some other things to capture water and create that water source. Um, take a stroll around your neighborhood. Um, notice what wildlife is there and what isn't. That wildlife may be domestic. It might be geese, it might be your dog, it might be the neighbor's cat. Um, it might also be deer or squirrels or other like wildlife that's out there. So kind of know 
knowing up front what your kind of potential pest pressure could be and animal involvement is going to be important to setting out your plan. Um, and then finally, we also want to kind of think about like what are kind of what are those other goals with your food? Um, if you're growing food or flowers, um, are you planning to preserve it? Do you want to eat it all fresh? Um, are you aiming to grow, grow all your own food for the summer or other times of year? Um, those are important things to think about as you start to think about size and also time. Um, so these are all questions and we're gonna kind of dig into them a little more as we think about different um, criteria for site selection for your garden. Does anyone have any um, thoughts or comments or other questions that they've been mulling around before we go forward? It looks like Katie's biggest concern is the animals, squirrels and cats. All right, we will definitely touch on that, Katie. Um, I'm curious just from a, um, understanding where you all are at. I know some of you share that you are just getting started or that you have a space already. Um, and I'm wondering how I can do this to find out. I'd love to know who is gonna be starting a garden for the first time, like in a new space um, and who is going to be um, using a space that they've already um, started a garden. If it's easy for you all to just type that in the chat, if you just wanna say that you've got a new space or you're, um, you're in a space that you've already used, um, that would be really helpful to know. Um, okay, so let's talk about um, some specifics around, some other specifics around site selection. We're gonna go into each of these topics um, in more detail. Um, and we really hope that by the end of today's class, we will have equipped you with some tools to be able to um, figure out if where, if you're starting a new garden, where's the right spot for it. And if you're continuing in a garden space you already have, and you have had maybe some challenges with it or um, something might not be working that maybe some of these things that we're going to discuss today um, might be the answer. So we're going to go into um, you know sunlight as we all um, know sun is a key ingredient in photosynthesis for our plants so it's an important um, piece of the puzzle um, when we want to grow things. Um, we're going to talk about slope um, and you know how that can affect your garden space. Um, you know if you if it's better to have your garden close to the house or further from the house, and and why. Um, we're going to think through the traffic that happens in the space where you want to grow, um, and how that can affect your garden. Um, about what size makes sense for you, and then we're going to touch on soil real quick. We're going to dig deeper into soil. Um, in the third and fourth week of our, or fourth and fifth week of our class, so. Um, so the first thing to really think about is proximity. Um, so gardens that are close to your house or places of work or places that you go every day are going to be the most successful gardens. Um, so, right, and it's just simply, right, we remember to do what we see all the time. It's kind of like if you have like piles of dirty dishes, you're going to eventually see them and kind of take care of them. And this is the same with gardens, right? The more you see them, um, just even in your periphery, you kind of have this plan that, oh, I've got to go address, address this issue. Or it's a, right, oh, this is like, oh, yeah, this is my space and my time. I need to go outside and take some time for myself and enjoy the garden. Um, some other advantages, particularly if you have a yard that um, could accommodate a garden, um, putting your garden in some kind of proximity to your house does help with a few other things. The first is water. Um, most homes have some kind of water hookup on the outside of them if you're planning to connect into um, water, um, municipal water. Um, if you don't have a water hookup on the outside of your house. Most houses also have gutters. Um, so we'll be talking about rain barrels and other ways to collect water 
um, for the purpose of using your plants. Um, homes are also really great heat sinks, which can be important for frost protection as like from like now going into spring and then in the fall going into winter. Um, our homes absorb a whole lot of heat and will radiate it back out and can create these kind of nice little microclimates that can keep your plants warmer than the air temperature. Um, your, your home and your property and any place that you're frequenting also provides a sense of physical protection for your garden. Um, animals, particularly wildlife, when we think about them, wildlife wants to be in their space and they want us to be in ours. So if you're out in your yard or in your home a lot and you're really active in those spaces, you're going to be physically protecting your um, garden from those from those critters because they're gonna say, oh, humans are here a lot. We're gonna go over somewhere else instead. Um, the other great thing about having your garden close to your house is again, that reminder of, gee, it looks like my green beans are really growing or my tomatoes are turning red. I should go out and pick them. So the closer your garden is to your house or in your like normal daily patterns of travel, the more um, frequently you'll notice that things are ready to harvest and the more able you are to go out and pick one or two things. You wanna, anyone have All any right. thoughts? Sorry, anyone have any thoughts oh. about homes, um, proximity? And just to touch on, I know a lot of folks also grow um, in spaces that are away from their homes, like you, might, you know, like a community garden type um, setup. Um, and, um, you know, it's just, if you're, if that's your, space where you're growing, just think about how you can make it a regular routine to be in that space. Um, because that can be really helpful uh, just to, you know, pop in for a couple minutes to just check how things are doing, even if you don't have an hour to spend working in the garden for that day, just to say, hey, and, and just check will we'll definitely increase your, um, your ability to, to have a successful uh, garden. For sure. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about sun. Um, so we have uh, a couple, well, if you already have an idea about where your garden space is gonna be, that's great. If you don't, um, one of the things that, <clears throat> that can help you pick if you have some choices um, is where you get the most sunlight. Um, so most of our plants want to have um, about six to eight hours of sun um, during the day. Um, some can do with less than that, but most of what folks grow in terms of vegetable crops really want that full, full sun um, exposure. And so um, the first thing to think about is just where in my space do I know that I have, um, you know, six to eight hours of sun per day? And during this season, um, it can be a little bit uh, challenging to figure that out, but I'll try to help you think through some things that might be different now than will be um, the, you know, the way things are when you start to, do, to put your plants in the ground in the spring. So think about as you're, as you're looking outside where the trees are, if you already have trees in your, in your yard <clears throat> that have lost leaves uh, for the winter um, because you're probably going to see more sunlight in that area right now than you would see um, than is going to happen in the spring and summer especially in the summer and the fall um, so that's one thing to consider um, that you as you're you know looking and observing your space the other thing to consider is that the sun is a little bit lower in the sky um, where we are here in Kentucky than it will be during the growing season so um, there is going to be, oh, it looks like I'm fading in and out. I'm gonna take my headset off and see if maybe that's a problem. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Great. Um, the sun is a little bit lower in the sky than it will be um, you know, in the, the spring and summer and fall. Um, so, that's another thing to consider is that if there are, maybe you have a, a fence line that borders your um, your yard and it's on like, for instance, I have a fence that borders my yard on the south side 
And right now I'm gonna get a deeper shadow from the sun than I would um, in, the, in the spring, especially in the summer when the, the sun is more overhead because it's not going to shadow. Um, it's not gonna have that, um, it's not gonna be lower in the sky and cast a, such a big shadow. So those are just things to think about as you're looking at your space. I think the best thing to do if you're um, trying to understand the sun pattern is really go sit outside and for kind of like at, you know, at 10, at 12, at two, at four, couple um, intervals throughout the day to see where the sun is um, in your yard. And another great tool in order to do that is to use um, Google Earth Pro. If you're a little bit tech savvy, you can go on, um, you can actually download that. It's a free software and it allows you to type in your address. And then there's a little sun icon where you can click and you can look at the shadows and how they move across your property. Um, where either at your home or where you're, if you're in a community garden space, um, and you can see how the shadows um, fall throughout the day at a particular time in the year. So if you wanted to check, um, you know, March 31st, where's the sun going to be, and July um, 1st, where's the sun going to be, it can be really helpful to understand um, those patterns. I, um, it's taken me a couple years actually to to really grasp my own yard and the, the, the patterns of the shade because I have a lot of trees in, in my yard. And so there's only a couple of spots that are really, that really work well for growing vegetables. Um, I definitely tried to push some areas a little bit further than, than would work. I, you know, I was like, oh, maybe this is gonna work. Maybe just a couple extra hours of shade will be okay. But really, um, if you can just get a grasp on that um, to begin with, you're going to have a lot more success, um, right? You know, just getting started. Um, you maybe it won't take you a couple of years like it did for me to to kind of, you know, figure it out. Um, and I will say also, um, if you another thing you want to really understand, and I mentioned this that I have a, a fence that's on the south side of my yard, is that you really want to figure out your cardinal directions um, in your space, and so. Um, our south facing um, parts, our south facing garden is, is kind of the best case scenario. You're gonna um, get the most sun in that area. It's gonna be the, the warmest spot. Um, and, but if you have a north facing um, space, that's okay. It's just helpful to understand that if you, get, if you have a choice, uh, picking that south facing garden space um, is, is just a better choice um, if, you can, if you can make it work. Um, and so if you, you know, over the next week, we're gonna ask you all to kind of sketch out your garden space. And if you can go out and figure out, okay, where's Northeast, South and West where I'm gonna be gardening and understand that direction. It's also gonna help as you're planning where your plants are gonna go in your garden um, because, you know, the sunlight will change depending on how tall um, the plants are in the space. Um, okay, did I get everything in that section? Great. Yep, absolutely. Cool. Any um, questions? I saw the chat kind of light. Oh, Bethany, we can't hear you. Oh, better? Better? Can you say something? Yeah. Oh, maybe I just can't hear you. <laughs> um, I saw like the chat kind of lighten up if you wanted to check in on that um, as we transition to their next kind of selection space. Let's see. I think it's on my end. My, I have to switch my speaker. So go ahead, Bethany. I think everybody else can hear you. Yep, so it looks like it. Awesome. Um, all right, so the next thing we're going to kind of touch on is slope. Um, so slope, so this is right angle, angle of the ground. So the, the more level you can have, the more level ground you have to grow on, the better off you're going to be. There are certainly ways to create level spaces if um, you are living in a part of town that maybe doesn't have a lot of level ground on your property. Um, I know in Louisville, particularly, we have um, some areas of town, I'm thinking about Clifton um, and some areas of the Highland where any kind of yard space that might be available is pretty steep. Um, you can absolutely plant on those areas, but it's going to take a little more thought and planning 
on how to either create level space or you're going to be thinking about planting in a way that preserves a lot of the grass and vegetation that's there to hold in your soil. Um, so why we like level ground is that we wanna keep as much soil in place for our plants to utilize as possible. Um, so as soon as we start removing vegetation like grass or any kind of plant life from the soil, we expose the soil to air and light and wind. All of those things can move soil away from our gardening area. Um, they will move slower if it's on level ground than if it is on an angle. Um, so things to think about. Um, however, if you've got some slope that can be very helpful, particularly for drainage, right? Water, all things run downhill. Um, and like, for example, if we have a really wet spring or summer, having a slight slope will help keep your garden from flooding, which is important. Um, another really important thing that a slope can do, particularly if it's a south facing slope, this will increase the warming of your soil in the spring and also the drying of your soil in the spring. Right now, if you've walked outside um, on any kind of grassy surface, you'll notice that we've had a lot of um, wet precipitation and our soil is pretty soggy. Um, so a south facing slope with our winter sun, we get the most sun um, on the south sides of our property. So that warm southern sun is gonna help dry out our garden. And then that coupled with a little bit of a slope will help dry and warm up your soil a lot faster, getting it ready for spring planting. Um, so those are some good things to think about, um, but this is the ideal situation. So again, if you've got maybe a less than ideal situation or a property that has maybe some extreme slope that does not disqualify you from growing things on there, we'll just really have to think through how to create a space that preserves your soil um, while still allowing you to grow. Okay, I'm going to try my headset again, because for some reason I can't hear you when you're speaking if it's off. So um, please let me know if it's cutting out. I think maybe it was my hair in the way or something. So we'll try and see what happens. Um, okay, so one more thing to consider um, are the traffic patterns in the area where you want to grow. Um, if you have pets at home um, and they are allowed to be outside, they probably have the their um, kind of their, their area where they like to go already figured out. They, um, at my house, my dog, um, we have a fence and he goes straight for the fence line and works the fence. Um, but he's also got some, some places that he kind of goes directly, especially where the squirrels, you know, corral so he can chase them. Um, and so uh, you wanna understand where those animals um, are already, moving throughout this or how they're moving throughout the space because it's pretty challenging to change that, um, those patterns. Um, unless you're going to, it's possible to change them. Um, you'll just have to think about um, creating uh, some barriers. So for instance, in my yard, um, it, I really wanted to grow in the ground. Um, I wanted to garden in the ground um, and it just wasn't possible for me because of my dog. Um, because he doesn't respect that boundary of, um, oh, okay, this is where the garden starts and the yard ends or the lawn ends. So I had to build some raised bed boxes um, for my garden and that and that's what worked. He, he respects that boundary. And so it's a happy um, relationship where he can have his space and, and we can have our garden space. Um, also think about if you have, um, you know, other people that live in this space or interact with the space where you're gonna grow, um, especially children. Um, Think about where they like to be, um, and especially if they're really little, um, and how that can impact the garden space. So if there's an area where they like to hang out and they really like to be, um, and um, you have another option, you might think about the other option if they've already kind of got their established place. A few of you have mentioned um, concerns about wildlife. I think somebody put in there that they think they might have moles. Um, so if you have noticed some areas where there are those types of problems and you have other choices um, for where your garden can be, then I would recommend choosing those, those different locations if you can. If you can't, that's fine. And we can talk about how you can mitigate um, having uh, wildlife issues. It's, it's gonna be a matter of setting up your garden in a way that again, creates a barrier to them um, or, you know, 
like Bethany said, sometimes when you just start working in a space and you're there and you're present um, and you're there in a consistent way, then you can get lucky and the wildlife can go find another place where they want to be. Um, but those are just things to consider as you're, um, as you're citing your place. You really want to shoot for those lower traffic areas in your, in your garden area. That made me think about um, wildlife traffic patterns too. Um, so if you've got fences around your property, um, I know in, in my house, I have a couple trees in the back of my property that have giant squirrel hotels in them. And like, it's just, I've tried to plant blackberries back there and it's just been a no-go. I have beautiful plants, but I never get any berries because I literally have the berries under the squirrel hotel. So squirrels run down the tree, even though I'm there all the time, pick a blackberry, hike back up the tree. Um, you know, so also fence lines can be great um, highways for other, you know, anything from a squirrel to um, neighborhood birds, to cats, to possums. Um, so if you kind of see some of those things in your yard and you have other locations, um, that's really good. Animals are just like people. They're going to choose the place that is easiest for them to get to to get their food. Um, if we make them work for it a little bit, they'll choose to go somewhere else. So check out those wildlife um, pathways too. And speaking on that, um, Katie, I think Catherine is the person who thinks they might have mold. And they were asking if putting chicken wire under the raised beds would deter the moles from coming up in that area. And I'm wondering, Catherine, do you already have the raised beds um, built or, and, and they are in them or um, are you planning to build them um, for the first time? I can't remember, haven't built them yet. Okay. Um, this is something um, we actually talked about on Monday too, um, about moles in the, in the yard. And um, I have experience, I know that putting, um, like hardware cloth on the bottom of a raised bed in your building, it will definitely deter gophers from getting into your yard. But Bethany shared some interesting information about moles um, and how they might be deterred just from a, a short barrier. So Bethany, did you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so moles don't bury, don't, it, we, we see moles because we've got those like nice little raised um, bumps in our yard. So they don't grow, they don't kind of burrow underground as aggressively as a lot of other animals. Um, so sometimes just even if you're planning on building raised beds or even if you have an in-ground garden and you want to create a barrier that maybe has some kind of border that goes down six inches into the ground, that is generally enough to keep moles out. Um, if you've got other animals in your yard, rabbits are particularly good burrowers, um, as are gophers and groundhogs and other things too, um, using something like a hardware cloth, which is like a mesh um, think about like a window screen made of wire that could go underground or at the bottom of your garden bed to keep things from burrowing under and up can be really, really helpful. Um, but for a lot of our other like shallow burrowing critters, just putting, going into the ground just a little bit with like, like a nice little rock border or something can be enough to deter them. Lilius, do you want to talk about the hardware cloth? Um, I know you've used that in some of your spaces. Sure, yeah. Um, so hardware cloth, I think, is like one of my like tools that I use a lot in my garden <laughs> for a lot of different things. Um, and so like Bethany said, you can attach, you can put it at the base of, if you're, raised, if you're building a raised bed, um, the, the great thing about it is that it can keep those critters out, but it allows for the plant roots to be able to still penetrate the soil below. So um, you can still, they can still access um, that space. Um, it's, if you use like a fabric, like landscape fabric, what's gonna happen is that the roots um, generally can't penetrate as, as well and the critters can usually chew through it. Um, so like the metal hardware cloth can be a better option, like a quarter of an inch um, can keep them out. Um, I also use hardware cloth. I used to um, have chickens and speaking of rabbits, it's a great way to keep them out of a raised bed. Um, I used to have chickens that shared the space of my garden um, when I had a very small yard. And so I put the hardware cloth around 
um, the raised bed just high enough so that I could still access the garden, but you know, maybe just the height of the chicken so that they aren't gonna be able to climb up. Um, they weren't flying, um, so they didn't get into the bed. It deterred them enough to stay out. And the same with rabbits, that can be a, a great way to deter rabbits as well. Um, but it can come in handy for a lot of different things. And you can usually get it at any um, garden supply store, hardware store, um, Um, and then somebody else just mentioned squirrels, um, which um, I've seen some really cool uh, kind of cages that people will build to put over their garden. If you have a, a severe squirrel problem, sometimes squirrels can, you know, take a tomato here and there and, um, you know, just kind of be a nuisance, but not just fully destructive in a garden space. And I think that's just, we all kind of, are, are, we're all creatures, we're all outside, we're kind of sharing this space together. And so that's just kind of the nature of gardening, right? Is that you're gonna have some creatures that come and might take a sample here and there. And, and hopefully that's as far as it goes. But if you have squirrels that are really um, kind of just destroying everything and, and digging up plants as soon as you plant them and pulling you know everything off of your plants, um, you can create, um, I see, I've, I've seen some really successful um, basically like a, a box that sits on top of your garden. Um, it can be made out of a lot of different kinds of materials, um, but some sort of hardware cloth or chicken wire or like the plastic chicken fencing um, that allows light and, and water to still penetrate, but can keep squirrels out in that way um, can be really useful for that. Um, and Aaron shared that raptor box in your yard or an owl box can also be really helpful. <laughs> Great, yep, exactly. Cool, any other um, comments, thoughts on this or are we ready to move on? Oh, just to clarify, someone asked a clarification of the hardware cloth for moles. Um, you could, bury the hardware cloth just vertically um, as on the perimeter or some or a piece of wood or something that would basically go about six inches deep like Bethany was saying. Um, for critters like gophers that are gonna dig down and come back up or deeper diggers, you would actually um, attach the hardware, you'd lay the hardware cloth up at the bottom of the garden box. So it would basically make the bottom of your box um, and you can attach it on the inside um, so that they can't get in anywhere um, underneath this space. Cool, and we can keep talking about critters more kind of in the chat at the end too, because that's yeah. always, always a challenge um, for sure. Um, so kind of the next thing to think about whether you're returning to your garden this year or you're starting one um, for the first time is to think about size. Um, so garden size is kind of dependent on multiple factors. Um, the first, right, is the number, is the amount of time overall that you have to dedicate to it. Um, so that's something to think about. If you've got pretty minimal time, if, and I think about time in the course of a week, like over a week, how much time collectively am I going to spend in my garden? Um, for me, for myself personally, I tend to be out in the evenings, um, probably, you know, 637 right before sunset for like a half hour, 45 minutes at most at a time. So I will get maybe three, you know, three or four hours of work in my garden during the work week, and then maybe have a couple longer hour long sessions during the weekend to do bigger projects. Um, so kind of think about the time that you have during the week to dedicate to your garden. And that's a good beginning to size. Um, and the next kind of thing with size too is to think about um, kind of what are your production goals? Um, if you are really excited about growing enough food to feed your whole family or to preserve, um, you are probably going to want to think a little bigger. Um, if you're just getting started or maybe you don't have enough time, um, or at least right now you don't, 
start small. You can do, there's a lot of really intensive cultivation techniques. And we're gonna talk a lot about those during this time um, that can help you really maximize production in a small space so that you're getting a lot of food, but you're not having to put as much work into larger scale management. Um, so I really encourage folks, especially if you're new, start small, think about going bigger over time. Um, and those are kind of your two kind of in-betweens. The other kind of third option is to start thinking about perennials. So if you have a goal to produce um, plants, so I'm thinking particularly about like berries, um, fruit trees and stuff like, um, stuff like that. So those are plants that we put in the ground once and they continue to grow year after year. You can utilize perennials as a way to have a bigger garden that maybe have really intensive management for a specific time of year. Um, and then you can set them up to be managed to be a little more self-sufficient in other times of the year. Um, so that's another way to kind of grow your garden in segments. And that is truly a personal um, production goals thing. Um, so all kind of things to think about, um, but always smaller is better. Plan your space so that if you know, okay, maybe this year I don't have a lot of time, but next year I'm gonna retire, in two years I'm gonna retire, or I'm gonna change jobs and I'll be home during the day. Um, I'll have time to garden. You can plan your space to grow out year after year. And that is a really great way to do it. Thoughts or questions on size? I'm curious, a couple of you shared um, that you're gonna be expanding your garden this year. Um, Melissa, Susanna, looks like Justin and Lex and Helen from the comments, I gathered that from the chat box. Would um, any of you wanna just share why you've made that decision to expand or, and what your experience has been? Maybe just. This is Melissa. Feel free to <laughs> um, I had, I had two little plots that, um, we did raised beds in that we combined into one last year. And, um, I went a little crazy buying seeds. And then I went and looked at the seeds that I already had. And I realized I'd gone really, really crazy. Um, <laughs> so I know that I have to rotate what I'm growing and put them in different places, but I also have, um, I have an addition that was built onto the back of the house. And then I have this strip of yard um, on the side of the addition that my husband has to mow and it's just a pain in the butt and it gets good sun. So I figure I should, you, you know, if I wanna reduce what he has to mow, it would be a good idea to start using some of that space and put in some more beds. Um, Cause like I grew pumpkins last year and they took over half of my, um, my little area. So it, it kind of killed out any of the tomatoes and other stuff I was trying to grow. So just to be able to grow more food, really. Thanks for sharing that, Melissa. It looks like Justin and Lex also are expanding because they started small last year, but they have a lot of space and their goal is to grow more food. Um, so they're feeling confident and kind of making that expansion happen this year. Um, and Helen's gonna grow food for them and the squirrels. All right. Sharing sometimes is the best strategy for sure. <laughs> yeah, super exciting. Um, I know for, for myself personally in my home garden, I have, I inherited some existing garden when I moved into my home. And then over the years, I've just slowly kind of dug up more area in um, different kind of square footage is based on the time that I had allowed and, and the specific space. So I've got one whole area now that by this spring will no longer be in lawn at all because I'll have dug up the rest of it. And it's taken me three years to dig that all up. Um, I tend to personally work in like about probably 20 square foot increments at a time which sounds like a lot, but for my garden, that means about two feet out from the existing structure and about 10 feet long. So I'm kind of expanding it forward. Um, and so that also speaks to the fact that your garden doesn't have to be a square or a rectangle. It can be any shape you want and you can continue to expand year after year 
in a in a shape in a location that makes sense for you so melissa was sharing like now she's going to add a strip on the side of her house um so really cool so be creative if your goal is to grow more over time um on your garden planning and size other thoughts before we move forward Okay. Still in with our observe, still with our observation um, kind of hats on. Um, we're going to check in about soil, and so at this point, um, really, what we want you to think about and to to look at is um, still thinking about where the garden can be located. Is to make some observations about the ground. Um, if you have um, areas in your yard where, especially right now, is a good time to make these observations where you're seeing after rain um, that water is cooling, um, or maybe, um, and, and maybe it takes like a couple days to a week for that water to get be absorbed into the ground. Um, that might be a place where there's some soil compaction or there's some other issues happening underground, and you might not see a lot of things that grow there. Um, and it can be, that might not be, that might not be a great place for an in-ground garden, but it could work if you wanted to do some raised bed gardening above that space. So that that's something to consider on figuring out kind of what kind of garden you can do there. Um, your, what your goal is if you're going to be growing in the ground is to really find, you know, is to have soil that is going to drain, um, be able to drain water precipitation um, within a 24 hour period. Um, you know, and so think about if you see any areas where water is sitting, maybe you're walking in your yard and it's really sloshy. You might not see the water cooling, but you can, you know, a couple days after it rains, it's still really wet and, and muddy there. Um, so just kind of understand uh, where the water might be sitting. Another thing that might be happening in that area or you might have and you might not know <clears throat> is that a lot of times in our in our yards, there might have been something in that space before, um, or in you know, where you're going to be gardening. There might have been a structure there. There might have been a, a, a gravel parking lot or a driveway. Um, and so, when you when you have an idea about where you want your garden to be, get out a shovel and go over there and dig a little bit and see if there's anything a um, couple inches down. In my yard, I had um, I have a deck. And what I didn't know is that underneath that deck is a concrete slab because over the years there has been soil that's built up on top of that. And, you know, the, there's been mulch, there's been leaves, there's been other things that have broken down. And so when I moved into my home, um, I had this idea to start an herb garden along the deck where some um, on an area that had not been planted. And when I went to go start planting and I put that shovel in the in the ground, two inches in or three inches in, I hit concrete, right? So we wanna know what's underneath the ground where, where we wanna to grow to make sure that it's gonna be a, a space that can um, support plant life. And we're gonna talk more about soil um, in, like I said, in, in, the, in the fourth and fifth week of the class. This is just a way for you all to think through, um, you know, where might be the appropriate place to have a garden if there are some um, challenges with the soil. It can be difficult to um, to change. <laughs> it's 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 very difficult to change the the entire kind of texture of the the soil of your yard. And so, if you've got some areas that might be challenging um, that you know, um, then you know there are some ways that you can work around that, and we can talk about that. Um, so we are not going to touch on this too much, um, but um, if you have animals as a part of your plan, and that's animals in addition to pets um, that you maybe already live in your home, but if you're thinking about adding things like chickens or bees, um, rabbits, goats, ducks, um, we also want to plan out your space to accommodate them or and make sure that they have appropriate habitat. Um, so this is just some examples of some animal space requirements if um, you are planning that into there. Um, on our um, 
class um, folder, we also have some, ex and also in your packets, are some example um, layouts that can be useful. Um, there's one particularly for a backyard farm that kind of shows how to, an idea for how to plan your space if you are having vegetables, maybe some perennial fruit trees, and then also animals. Um, and if folks are really interested in considering um, animals as a part of their landscape and want to talk about that a little more, we are happy to support you on that. Um, both Elias and I personally over the years have had chickens. Um, and so we can share some kind of of our personal experiences and then also a lot of other um, good research based information for that, um, as well as um, for bees and some other animals as well. So just really quickly to kind of touch base for that too, um, you know, something to think about. Okay, so I mentioned towards the beginning of the class to it'd be helpful to have a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen nearby. Um, I'm gonna just ask you to take a minute or two and um, and this is gonna be kind of your homework assignment uh, over the next week to, to bring back to class. But if you wanna to start to um, really just kind of do a rough sketch of where you're thinking um, your garden is going to be or it currently is and um, identify some things that you know are going to be there that are kind of permanent um, and then it will help you kind of think through the best layout for your space or the best expansion um, area for your space. So, uh, you know, take a piece of paper and, you know, circles and squares and, and just words work well. You don't have to be an artist to be able to do this. Um, but you wanna, you know, write down where are the buildings that are um, in this space, the things that aren't gonna move, the fence lines, where are there plants that are, um, not going anywhere. You have trees, you have um, some perennial plants that you know you don't replant every year but it just come back every year. Um, rose bushes, hedges, things like that. Um, where are the paths and the sidewalks that exist in this space? Um, this is a great time to you know up in the corner write your cardinal directions um, northeast, southwest uh, and identify where those are. And so this is just an exercise to kind of map out that space, see it visually in front of you. Um, so that when we come back next week, we can look at those um, sketches and talk through if there's anything that you notice. A lot of times when you do this, you might, you actually will notice things that you might not have noticed before, or you'll see something that is that kind of starts um, you to think, oh, you know, this actually might be a much better place for my garden or, oh, this is here and I have to think about um, that I have to work around that. Um, another thing to identify in here, like Bethany was talking about before is where water is located. So you can put like, where's your, your hose bib on your house or where's the, the garden hose um, closest location to you or where's a, you know, a rain barrel that I've got um, that's catching water, things like that. So just take a minute or two and, and just start that sketch out. Um, and <clears throat> this will be um, something that we hope that you'll the folks will want to share and talk about um, next week when we come back. Bethany, can you skip to the last, I think it's the last slide that has an example, the one that I did for my yard. It's just circles and squares and lines and easy things to just kind of jot down. Um, where and even where you're thinking that you want to put something too, you can put you know that on there. Like maybe you have, um, you really want to plant a, an apple tree in your yard, and you're thinking, oh, this is the place I want to put that. So as folks are um, starting to do some drawing and brainstorming, um, going out and taking a stroll through your yard or your gardening space is pretty, pretty critical. Um, I know I do this every year and I feel like every year I find something in my yard that I didn't either remember that I planted or had or that's planted itself. Um, so important to go out and also do that. Um, while you're out there, you should take some soil samples of any locations um, that you are, after walking around, you think, man, this could be the spot for my garden. Um, 
so the soil, right, it provides all the food that we need for our plants. Um, and so having some soil samples, either from the space that you know is going to be your garden or from a couple different potential spots can help you make some decisions. Um, you all in your packet have um, this sheet, just like pictured here that says how to take a good soil sample. You also have um, two little white soil sample baggies in your packet. If you don't have those soil sample baggies in your packet, that's fine. You can bring soil in in any kind of clean container. The important thing is that you have two cups of dry soil. Um, all right, so what you're going to do once you've kind of narrowed down a couple spots where you're going to take your have your garden, you want to take your soil sample. So if you are strolling around and you've got kind of an area that in your mind, we want to get out a clean shovel and a clean container or bucket. Um, why we keep stressing this is, is clean is because if you've used your shovel in another part of your yard or in your friend's yard or somewhere else, this soil sample test is taking, is doing like a micronutrient analysis. So you want to make sure that the, the shovel and the bucket are clean so you're not getting the nutrient analysis of, you know, your neighbor's garden or the, you know, the leaves that you shoveled out of your, out of your drain or whatever. So make sure they're both clean. Um, and then you're going to stroll around, you're going to take about eight to 10 samples. So what you're going to do, you're going to take your shovel and then you're going to remove grass or other, um, if you've got mulch over your garden or leaves or something, anything that's covering the soil, you want to remove that first and then stick your shovel down into the garden bed about the depth of your whole soil, uh, your whole shovel, um, even a little less if you wanted, but we want six inches kind of top to bottom as our sample. Um, you're going to pull that shovel out and then you're going to remove the sides so that you've kind of got like a little central core of soil. And that's what you're going to add to your bucket. And you're going to repeat that process in multiple areas of your garden. You want to get about eight to 10 of those samples per total garden area. Um, and then you're going to mix them all up Put, a, put two cups worth of that into the soil sample baggie or your clean plastic bag or whatever and bring it to the extension office. Um, the extension office is located at 4200 Gardner View Avenue. If you're dropping off in Louisville, if you live in a county outside of Jefferson County, you want to take that to your um, county extension office to get their soil sample done there. Um, our local county extension offices have a partnership with the conservation district to do at least two free soil samples per home. So please take advantage of that. Um, and what will happen is you'll the soil will then be mailed to a laboratory. We will all receive um, in the mail or an email a nice soil sample readout that we'll talk about as a class later on. Um, so that's kind of our other homework assignment for today. Take that, take a stroll, make your map, and then take some soil samples. Do folks have questions about how to take soil samples? You also, if you're, um, if you're taking the sample down, the ground is wet. Um, you want to make sure you dry out that soil for a couple days before you um, bring it into the extension. So you can take the sample now, um, but you just want to let it kind of, you know, lay it out on a tray or a, a plate or something and let it dry um, before you take it in. And I'm curious with Helen and Catherine who, are, um, who aren't in the U.S., um, do you all have a place where you can um, take a sample of your soil or do you need kind of assistance in figuring that out? Oh, Catherine's in Louisville, just originally from England. Okay, did it, got that. <laughs> well, um, Helen, if you do, if you need to, if, if you need help in figuring that out, let us know and we'll help you um, navigate a place where you can do that. We'll also have, um, the, the whole idea is that we're testing um, our soil for the nutrient load in the, in the soil. And um, to understand 
if we're deficient in anything. Um, testing your soil is an excellent tool in your toolbox to, to be able to work through any issues that you might have in your garden. And it's something that um, if you haven't done it before, um, can be really eye-opening and can really help you understand. Um, I think somebody had mentioned earlier that they might have planted some things and they just didn't grow, they were really small. And that, um, when I hear that, I instantly think that that could be a, a deficiency in your, in your nutrients in your soil is one of the reasons why that might happen. Um, so it's just something um, to be able to help you kind of, um, you know, troubleshoot some issues and also create a, an environment that is um, really balanced and really, you know, our soil is one of the key ingredients, right, in growing healthy, happy plants. And so um, understanding it and knowing kind of what we're working with is, is really helpful when we're gardening. Um, so this is really a, a tool that we're hoping will help you all understand. So we'll have those, um, if you're not able to take your soil sample now, um, maybe you don't have access to a place where you can do it, or you um, don't yet know where your garden's going to be, or maybe you haven't built that garden yet, and that's okay. We will have a sample um, lab analysis that we can share with you so you can follow along with us as we're kind of doing the math and figuring out how, how to understand what those tests are saying. And if you do know um, that you are going to be building a garden and maybe you're going to be bringing in soil or you're going to be um, using pots and you're using a bagged soil, um, you can absolutely take a soil sample from that bagged soil to, um, to get tested. And if you know where you're going to be buying soil from, maybe you're building raised beds and you're going to be buying soil, you can get a sample from them and have that tested as well. You can do it now before you buy the soil just to, to kind of go through this exercise. But I would recommend actually when you get this, when you actually order the soil and have it delivered that you do it again because a lot of times they'll source um, some of components of their soil mixes from different places. So you want to, um, you know, test the actual soil that you're gonna have at home too once you get it. But you can go and you can request the company, you can say, hey, can I show up and just get a scoop because um, I'm doing a soil test and they'll, they'll absolutely um, be open to that. Um, as we're kind of wrapping up today, we just wanna share that, um, right, this is one of the many places to get support um, through for gardening um, through this class, but there's a whole network of folks in Louisville who are always talking about gardening and sharing resources and other things. Um, so the Louisville Urban Agriculture Coalition um, is this amazing network of home gardeners, gardening professionals, um, and gardening enthusiasts and local food enthusiasts who meet um, the fourth Thursday of every month from 12 to 1.30. Um, and we do a lot of collaboration on specific projects, on citywide projects, um, and we want to invite every one of you all to be a part of that. Um, as a part of that, um, the Agriculture Coalition also hosts the City Growers Chat Hour. So that's every Friday from 12 to one on Zoom. Um, Willis and I are there most Fridays. Um, and it is just an open space to ask, kind of like pick everyone's brain who shows up and talk more about gardening. Um, so if you are interested in joining both of those um, or either, we definitely encourage you all to think about um, those spaces as ways to continue getting um, resources locally and also connecting with other people and hearing ideas from other folks in the community about what has worked for them on their garden. Um, and then kind of finally to wrap up um, just the portion of the class, kind of our homework today is to create a map like this beautiful map that Lilius has here of your space. Um, and just kind of, you know, know what's there, know what isn't. And then also take some soil samples and bring them to the extension office. We'll be getting back together next Friday, which is February, um, February the 12th, which is next Friday. Um, so we will be excited to see you all then as well. Um, and so it is almost, a, a go ahead. There's a couple questions um, that came through the chat. 
before we wrap up um, this part of the class that I wanted to make sure we just share about. Sorry to cut you off there, Bethany. No, no worries. Um, so somebody was asking about cleaning the shovel and if they needed, if like soap and water is fine or need to use alcohol or just water. Um, you can, you can just rinse it off with water. Soap and water is great if you have access to that. You don't need to use um, alcohol to clean the shovel in the bucket. Um, and then um, there was another question about um, the hours um, when folks can drop off the soil um, sample to the extension office. Sure, yeah, good question about the hours. So this is, um, it's a contactless drop. So you can walk into the building Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Um, when you come in the front door, you'll see this um, tub next to, uh, with a hot pink sign on it that says, getting your garden started class soil drop. Um, and you, if you've got your soil samples and um, if you have a soil voucher or, and also your kind of soil sample form, you've got a sample form in your packet that you can fill out. If you don't, we have a station inside the drop area where that you can fill out as well there. Um, so you can come in Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30, leave your soil in the container and I will take it from there in terms of getting it packaged up and sent to the lab. Um, so Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30. Um, if you are struggling to meet those times, please let Lilius and I know and we can make some arrangements with you all to do a drop at one of our houses or meet you somewhere at another time to do that if you're in the Louisville area and need that as well. And then um, Ashley asked about, um, Ashley's doing a nutrient test and a lead test for soil um, contamination of lead. Um, they have a um, house that's older and are wondering if there's a place to get paint chips tested um, in Louisville um, for lead. And um, there, there was, and I'm trying to look on the um, city website. They used to, you could you used to be able to request um, a, a lead testing um, solution that you can spray on the paint. Um, and so I'm gonna see if I can find that for you, actually. Um, it's been a couple of years now since I've accessed that. Um, so I'm not sure if it's still happening, but I'll see if I can find it and send it to you. Um, and is there still the lead um, test vouchers available for soil? Absolutely. If, if you are interested in, um, you think that you might have um, some lead paint that's chipped and is in your soil, or you might live in a place that might be um, heavy industrial um, area use area, or you're going to be gardening in that, um, it is a um, it is a good idea to test for lead contamination, and you can request a soil voucher to do that through the same link um, that I sent you all to request a voucher here in Jefferson County for the nutrient test. And um, you can get that sample taken in at the same time. You wanna do, you actually can take a sample in for the lead contamination test and they will also test that sample for, nutrient te for nutrients. So um, you don't have to take a separate sample to do, um, to do that. It will just be a different form that you'll get back because it's a different lab. Um, and Bethany and I can talk you through um, what you see on that form. Um, it'll just be a little, it'll just look a little bit different. Um, and then Karen was asking about paper copies of the documents. Um, Karen, were you able to pick up um, the packet from, for the class for? Yes, yes. Which which paper cop which documents were you trying to find paper copies? Well, that screen that was up that had the URL for the Friday oh, meeting. I understand. And I couldn't oh. I, I couldn't cut and paste it. So I thought if I got the document, I would have the information. Absolutely. So the link, um, Bethany, if you want to stick the link back in the chat for the folder for all of our documents, and we'll send it out again. Um, but the the week one um link for for this week's um, information will have this presentation in it so you can go through and, and grab anything out of it that you would like um, and if you want a paper copy or Karen I can just email you the link to that that garden chat too um, if that's helpful sure. Happy to do that. Uh, 
Actually, I was looking for the electronic copy of the of the documents. Not Great. Okay. Yeah. Those are in the class folder. Okay. I'm gonna stop recording and we can kind of keep chatting and um, we'll put let's put those links in our chat.